Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, cause Jesus is the way. Today we're going to be talking about the topic of life coaching. Now as how is life coach different from the ministry coaching that we talked about, from the executive coaching, from the leadership coaching, from the business coaching? Life coaching is the overall subject, the overall topic. And of course the question is, does ministry fit into life? Hopefully. Does business fit into life? Does leadership fit into life? Does executive coaching fit into some people's lives anyway? And so we have an overall topic here, and that's why we call it Bible-based life coaching, because we coach anything and everything in life. Let's look at some of those different things and see what the topics are. And then what we're going to do in this particular lecture is we're going to go through the story of Jesus in the book of Luke. And we're going to just pick out little spots and show you that Jesus did every one of these topics as he discipled or coached his disciples. We'll see them over and over again. But here are some of the different topics that we're looking at. We're going to see ministry, leadership, executive, and business coaching. We're going to see spiritual coaching, coaching for marriage, coaching for family and children, coaching for work, for ministry in the church, for finances, for social life, for career development. And then we're going to see what we call specialized coaching. We'll have a part of an entire session just talking about specialized coaching later on. But specialized coaching is when you're focusing in on a very small part of the person's life. And those areas uh, we call coaching through change or loss. Coaching through life transition. Coaching through problems. Coaching for life balance coaching through stress, coaching to achieve quality of life. Can you see those are all topics that you might run into as you're trying to coach someone or as you're trying to counsel somebody, right? So that's what we're going to be looking at here. So now let's pick up the story of Jesus as he's reaching out to first find his disciples, because what is our first step? Hopefully by now we've gone through these steps so many times, you almost have them memorized, right? Well, we hope so, because you're going to need them, okay? The first one is what? Establishing the relationship, right? If you don't have a relationship, it's a little bit hard to coach people these days. Luke 5, 3. And he, that is Jesus, entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Wasn't this an interesting way that Jesus got to know Simon Peter? He just goes out there and says, Hey, could I borrow your ship for a bit? <laughs> but by doing that, he got a relationship established, didn't he? And what kind of coaching was he doing there? I believe this is the beginning of ministry coaching. What's our next step? Self-evaluation. Verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a droth. Now what kind of coaching is he doing? How about business coaching? What is Simon's business? Fishing. Has Simon been doing very well in his business? It seems every time we run into Simon Peter, what do we find out? He's caught nothing. He's been all night doing like he's supposed to do, and he catches nothing. Do you think he needs a coach? And especially this particular coach. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Isn't this interesting? And this whole self-evaluation, that just the way Jesus treated him, brought him to his knees doing a self-evaluation, didn't he? 
He said, ah, yeah, this coaching stuff's pretty powerful. See, as a coach, what do you need to show your people you're coaching? That this stuff works. It can make a difference in their business. So whatever area you happen to be working in, if you can demonstrate that it really works, are they going to be interested? What's our third step? Find the dream. I'm going to call this coaching through life transition. What's the transition here? Let's listen to the verse. Verse 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So what's the transition? From one job to the other job, right? So you ever got this picture of how dramatic this was? These fishermen who almost never caught anything just had the biggest drop of fishes so much that the two ships were sinking and they hit the land, leave all the fish there and walk off. That's pretty dramatic. But see, they knew the source, didn't they? And you as a coach need to make sure that the people you're coaching know that this is God doing this. This isn't just because you're a good coach, right? What was the dream? Instead of catching fish, they were going to catch men, right? And the life transition was changing from being a fisherman for fish to a fisherman for men. The next we're going to suggest, we're still under finding the dream, ministering in the church. Luke 6, 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a, a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. That's Jesus, of course. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. And of course, we know the twelve apostles, right? Now, why is that ministry in the church? There's a principle here. What's the principle? I've heard it called, run with the runners. In other words, what you need to do is find out the people that are enthused, that have a passion, that are going after this thing, and get those people around you, and those are the ones you want to disciple, because those are the ones who are going to run with it, right? They're going to go someplace. If you constantly have to convince people that they want to come to church, or convince people they want to be discipled, you've missed it. See, Jesus had huge crowds of thousands, and out of those he only chose 12, didn't he? Is there a limit to how many people you can disciple? Of course there is. Because you only can have so many that you can spend time with. Okay. Now, over many years, you could disciple more. But no, you can only spend, in 12, is actually quite a few people to be discipling at once, isn't it? Number four, counting the cost. Verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall persecute you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets." That spiritual coaching, what's he saying? Is this going to cost you something? Do you think that maybe people might say bad things about you or may put you down or may try to look you bad if you go out and do what God calls you to do? Now, obviously, that's the case, and this is coming in the cost. And how about in your social life? But I say unto you which here, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. And as ye would that men should do unto you, do ye also to them likewise. What's it saying? It's saying if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be part of this, you are going to have to do what's right no matter what other people do. No more of this, they hit me first. <laughs> or any of that childish stuff. 
No, no matter what they do to you, you need to follow the Sermon on the Mount. You need to do what Jesus says and do what is right and love other people, even if they don't love you and no matter what they do to you. And that's part of the cost, isn't it? Because our flesh would like to do a few other things, depending on what the situation is. But you don't have that option if you're really going to be a disciple and really follow Christ. Career development. Verse 46. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? What's another part of the cost? If you're not obedient, can God really help you? If you won't listen to your coach, can your coach really help you? Probably not. Number five, make a plan. Luke 7, 28. Now I say to you that among those that are born of women, there is not greater than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What's the point here? What is the plan? That you become like John the Baptist. Now, what is it about John the Baptist that is this plan? What made him so great? He found what God called him to do. He didn't compete with other people. He even said, I must decrease, Jesus must increase. He handed his disciples off to Jesus. He accomplished his mission and got out of the way. That's the plan for each one of us, isn't it? Find out what God called us to do and for anyone you're coaching. And help them find that plan and help them carry out that plan. And that's what will make you great in the kingdom of God. Luke 8, 20. And it was told him by certain that said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. This is counseling for family and children, isn't it? Who's to be our priority? God. Verse 23. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the wind and the waves, and they obey him. That's coaching through stress, isn't it? What's his answer to stress? Just take your authority in Jesus and command the winds and the waves and they will stop and have faith. Ministry coaching. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus said unto him, saying, Return to thy own house, and show how great things God has done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Remember, this is a situation at the Gadarenes where he cast out the demons into the pigs that ran into the water. But what's he teaching the disciples? Each one of us has a different mission, don't they? This particular man was to witness in his own area and tell people there it wasn't his mission to join and be one of the 12 disciples and so on and so forth. So we need to follow and carry out what God calls us to do, not come up with our own ideas and do our own thing. Now here we have some leadership coaching. Do you say we have so many different types of coaching all put into all this? And I'm just hitting some verses I'm going through the book of Luke. How much coaching do you think you could find if you really studied the book of Luke? Yes, every kind you can possibly imagine. Luke 9, 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He's sending them out to become leaders, 
They've been following him. They've been watching what he did. Now it's time for them to go out and for them to start doing it. And he gives them a chance. Later on also he sent out 70. And so part of his plan for us is what? In the way of leadership coaching. That you get training maybe like you're getting in this class right now, but eventually what's going to happen? A practicum. <laughs> We're going to send you out with real clients and with real people to coach. And you're going to get a chance to apply this all after first you get to apply it in class here with your other classmates. And then business coaching, verse 3. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor script, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatever house you enter into, there abide and thence depart. He's telling you particularly, go do it and I want you to do it this way. I want you to go out in faith and just live by your faith. Don't go and take a whole bunch of money. Just live by the people that you help. And see how well this works. Later on though, what did he tell them? Just before he knew he was going to be arrested, he said, now, this time, take your coat and take your money and take your sword and take your other stuff. So there's a time for different things in ministry. That's what he's teaching him. Next, act according to the plan. Verse 6, And they departed and went unto the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Until you apply it, you don't really have it. And it's really not happening. Verse 13, But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. Verse 16, Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up to heaven and blessed them and brake and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat, and they were filled. And there was taken up of fragments that remained of them twelve baskets. Then verse 25. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself and be cast away? What's he teaching them about financial coaching here? Trust God. That God can multiply your fishes and your loaves that feed 5,000. That it's not getting focused on the things and meeting your needs in this world. It's focusing on the kingdom of God and trusting God. And if you lose yourself because you're chasing after all these things, you're really losing out on life. And verse 28, life transition again. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. Why did Jesus take them up to the top of Mount Tabor for the transfiguration? There was going to be a major transition coming very soon, wasn't there? And they needed to have a solid foundation for this transition to know for sure that he was the Son of God because he was going to be crucified and raised from the dead. And then they were going to have the ball, weren't they? And so they needed a solid foundation. Number seven, overcoming discouragement. You mean in Jesus' life, people got discouraged? I'm going to call this coaching through problems. And I besought thy disciples, right after they came down from the transfiguration, to cast them out, and he could not. Verse 22. And as he yet was coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. What was the problem? Disciples couldn't do it. Jesus had to show them again. Verse 46. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest, and said unto them, verse 48, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. 
That's executive coaching, isn't it? What's it saying? Don't compete. Now, you serve other people. You love other people. You do what is right. And God will promote you. That's how you make it. And that's how you grow and become an executive. It's not by competing with other people and trying to make yourself look better. And verse 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? And he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you were of. For the Son of Man is come not to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. I think they were sort of discouraged. They're going along. The people are, you know, get out of here. We don't want you. And how are the disciples going to handle this? Did they need Jesus to coach a little bit here? Yeah, I said, no, you got this wrong. We're here to serve other people. And even if they reject you, that doesn't mean you bring fire down from heaven and pray curses on them and do all sorts of things. You just blow them off and go on your way and maybe get another chance next time. Now, ministry coaching. Verse 57, And it came to pass, as they went on their way, a certain man said unto them, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said to him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, you're totally focused and you're going to serve God. If you have other things in your life, you're really not fit. This whole coaching thing is really not going to work. And now spiritual coaching again. Luke 11, 1. And it came to pass that as they prayed in a certain place that he ceased. And one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So among all this stuff, he's giving him practical advice. Now he needs to teach them how to pray. So we have spiritual aspects that are being dealt with here. And financial coaching. Do you see, we just keep going back and forth, different things. As they become appropriate, he's dealing with them. But is he dealing with their entire life? Have you seen anything he's not dealt with so far? But everything you can think of. Luke 12, 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. In verse 18. And he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall be these things which thou hast provided? What's he saying? Don't get focused on gathering up stuff in this world so you can eat, drink, and be merry, and have fun, and retire at 30. Do what's needed in the kingdom of God. Verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto thee, Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for your body what you shall put on. For life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. That's coaching for life balance. How many times do you think you're going to need to tell somebody you're coaching that? when they're all caught up and have all these fears and they're struggling and they're stressed out and everything in life, the answer is what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Get your focus where it needs to be. And now coaching for the quality of life. Verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags that wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you want quality of life, what do you need to do? Focus on the things of God again. If that's where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be, and that's what's going to bring everything into focus. And verse 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward who his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find doing. Of a truth, I say unto you, that he will make him ruler of all that he hath. That's career development. If you want to develop your career in the kingdom of God, what do you need to do? Be faithful. Do what is right. Take care of the job that God has given you to do, and then he will do what? Make you ruler of all that he hath. You do well at what you have. You go step by step. You get more and more and more as you're faithful of what's going on. But Jesus didn't leave out social life either. Luke 14, 8. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest place, lest a more honorable man than thou be biddest of him. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, and when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. In other words, don't make yourself into somebody. Be humble, like Moses and Jesus were. And then people will say, No, you're worth more than that. You sit over here. But you act as humble and you see yourself as God sees you. How about marriage? Luke 16, 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now we have overcoming obstacles. What kind of obstacles did Jesus show them? Luke 22, 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me at the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. What's that telling us about overcoming obstacles in life? Don't be codependent. See, if Jesus was codependent dealing with Judas, what would he have done? He would have said nothing. He said, oh, I must have handled it bad, but I just didn't do things well. I turned it on himself, right? If he was codependent, independent, what would he have done? Hey, Peter and John, when we go to the upper room, check Judas over. <laughs> but instead of that, do you see that he took them on straight out, didn't he? Right in front of everybody else, he confronts the situation. He didn't say who it was, but he confronted the situation and dealt with it straight on. And in our life, what do we need to do? You need to teach the people you coach to deal with stuff straight on, not to play these dumb little codependent games or other manipulations or other stuff like that, to handle stuff straight on in life. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What's this? Life transition again. What's about to happen? Jesus is going to be taken away from them and he's preparing Peter to be able to handle it. What does he know is going to happen to Peter? He's going to have a struggle going through this transition. Verse 47. And when he yet spake, behold, the multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Coaching through change or loss. Is this a loss that Jesus gets arrested? That Judas betrays him? And Jesus showed him how, right? After Peter pulled out his sword and whacked off the ear of the high priest's servant, he says, okay, don't massacre them all. These are Roman soldiers. You know what Roman soldiers do to people that do stuff like that? 
And he calms them all down, heals the guy's ear, and says, now let these go because you just want me. See, do you see, in his life, he's demonstrating to them of how to do things in life correctly, even after they mess them up royally, time after time after time. And you as a coach, what are you going to have to do? Demonstrate with your life how to handle things. Do you think the person coaching you is me watching you? Yeah, if you lose it and they see you at church going mad and jumping up and down and screaming and so on, do you think that's going to help them? And that's going to teach them to jump up and down and scream when things don't go right. Verse 54. Then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Verse 57. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord that he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Jesus didn't even say a word. How did he coach him? Just look at him. Doesn't have to be some big, flamboyant thing. But Peter knew. Luke twenty-three forty-two. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Where was this? On the cross. This is the thief. Now you'd think that a person would sort of give up this whole coaching thing after you've been crucified. Wouldn't you think that would be the case? <laughs> so what's this telling us? Even if you get crucified for being a coach, don't give up. Just keep on keeping on. Because Jesus was even coaching from the cross. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What was the main coaching Jesus was doing on the cross? What was he saying? By his life he was saying, You know, unless a seed die and fall into the ground, it doesn't bring forth fruit. He's saying you have to be willing to die in this thing for other people and care for other people. See the intensity of the coaching here? Maybe you didn't sign up for all this, huh? <laughs> Own the vision. Verse 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What is the vision here? This is spiritual coaching. What is Jesus' vision? It's that they're now going to carry the ball here. They're going to go forth, aren't they? And they're going to be endued with power. And they're going to go forth and carry out this coaching, this discipling uh, throughout the entire world. And accept the mantle. Acts 2.1 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, even as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now look at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is the mantle? It's the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's that you are now a minister for God. You are now going forth for God, carrying out exactly the same stuff that Jesus did, right? See, what was Jesus doing? Cloning himself. What do you need to do as a coach? Get yourself to the place that you can clone yourself. And then pass in on the mantle. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So how far is this coaching supposed to go? From generation to generation to generation to generation. And if you look at these 12 steps that we've been talking about, see, each person that you coach is to pass on that mantle to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. And if this actually happened, 
what would happen? The entire world would be evangelized, wouldn't it? The entire world would be coached. The entire world would come into everyone finding their calling and carrying out their calling in this life. And that was Jesus' plan. He took the 12, and within about 70 years, they evangelized most of the known world. Through what? Discipleship. Through life coaching. Through evangelism. Through being apostles and starting more churches and so on. Throughout the entire world. So I'm suggesting what? This is the core of Jesus' ministry. This is the core of his pattern of how to do things and how to have an impact in the world far beyond your own life. How many people was Jesus? How many Christians are there today? What's the potential of what we're talking about here? What's the potential of you taking what God's told you and help other people and coach them. And if you do a good enough job, they coach the next people and the next people and the next people and the next people. And how much impact could you have in this world from what you're doing? And how many rewards would you have in heaven? Because you get rewards from everyone you've touched and all that they have touched, right? Could this be a powerful ministry? If you learn to do it effectively and like Jesus did it? Think about how Jesus did this, because I want to point out another thing here. See, we can get into the mechanics of this, can't we? In this course, we're going to have to teach you the mechanics. But what was there about Jesus that went far beyond the mechanics? The love. He really cared for them. Is that going to be important in your coaching? Are they going to be able to tell whether you are really invested in them and you have their best interest in them and when they mess up, you cry for them. When they, when they do well, you're happy for them. See, there's a real whole life connection here. And it's in the Spirit of God, the Spirit that lives inside of you, connecting to the Spirit that lives inside of them to make this real and whole and complete. And remember, it's not something that's taught it's something that's caught. And when you catch that and you get that incitement and you pass on that enthusiasm to the people you're coaching, that's what's going to make the difference, isn't it? Even if you don't get every detail down or you skip one of the steps or you don't ever do everything exactly right. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to get deeper into these stories. Because obviously I just skimmed the surface of this kind of stuff and really start looking at the Bible and start seeing this whole coaching thing of helping and discipling other people and the whole character that was involved in the whole thing. That you can really count in the kingdom of God powerfully through just this one thing, if not many others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a model. You've shown us, Lord God, how we ought to disciple and coach other people. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us and strengthen us and raise us up and help every person in this class, Lord, to become all that they can be and then pass that on to the next generation and the generation after that. And we give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Him there's no other Cause Jesus is the way Jesus is the answer